You hold Bella too tight. I must set forth into waters. Hey, welcome back to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and let's talk about Poor Things. So we're going to explain the ending of this movie and break the entire film down. It is, obviously, a reimagining of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, but the film is also layered with symbolism that goes much deeper than the surface influences of Mary Shelley's incredible novel. You see, here's the real meaning of this movie. Director Yorgos Lanthimos uses Mary Shelley's original myth to take us on a journey through humankind's evolution of thought. Bella's coming of age is actually a symbolic journey through several different different schools of art and philosophy, like the Enlightenment, Romanticism, Transcendentalism, and even 1930s Hollywood. We begin the movie with several stills of embroidered silk images, set to an eerie soundtrack of violins. Now this reminds us of older Hollywood horrors such as Bram Stoker's Dracula, which Poor Thing cinematographer Robbie Ryan cites as one of the main sources of his inspiration. Now, obviously, these images are foreshadowing events that we see later in the movie, but more importantly, the embroidery shows how an artist tells a story on something clean and untouched, much like Godwin Baxter's creation of Bella that we're going to talk about throughout the video. Our next shot slowly zooms in on a woman at the edge of a bridge in a striking blue dress. Again, we're reminded of an older Hollywood style through the creeping zoom from behind and as she crashes into the river below. This sends us into a world of black and white. We're given the impression of returning to the beginning of something, a world before color, just like the 1930s Hollywood films that inspired poor things. Lanthimos actually told production designer Shona Heath and James Price, You obviously wanted a 1930s film, but with today's technology. Poor Things is broken up by these title cards that punctuate the movie. The font and the images call to mind some of the earliest films where scientists would film their experiments. So when we see our first images of Bella and God when Baxter, we're leaning in, like scientists tasked with understanding this strange course of events. All of this, the silk embroidery, the blue dress, the crash to black and white, the title cards, they have all been ramping us up to prepare for the punch of the movie's first spoken line. A pile of organs without the spark of self from a brain or the pump of blood from a heart, just a butcher's tray for a Sunday lunch. It's significant that the first character to speak is scientist Godwin Baxter. For one, Baxter is God the Father, the creator of Bella. So just like in the book of Genesis, Baxter speaks this world into existence. Baxter also has all these biomechanical traits. He's scarred, his face looks pieced together, and he needs machines to eat and burp. And this is all because Godwin Baxter serves as a reminder that the entire film operates as a Frankenstein of Frankenstein. Bless you. No, Doug, not a sneeze, a Frankenstein of Frankenstein. Explain. All right, real quick. In 1816, an 18-year-old named Mary Shelley wrote a novel called Frankenstein, or The Modern Prometheus. It tells the story of Victor Frankenstein, a scientist who creates a hideous eight-foot-tall creature by piecing together dead body parts and reanimating it with the spark of life. The creature is rejected by society and struggles with its existence, eventually seeking revenge against its creator. You okay, bud? So that eight-foot-tall hideous person don't got no friends? Uh, creature, not person, and no, none. How very sad. Excuse, Doug. Now, there is so much to say about the genius and context of Shelley's book. So throughout this video, we're going to be referring back to its key parts to show you how this movie retells its story in new ways that you could have never even imagined. When we say it's a Frankenstein of Frankenstein, what we mean is that the original story has been taken apart and reassembled into an entirely new tale. So notice that Godwin is scarred and pieced together because he was the subject of his father's experiments, much like how in the novel, Victor Frankenstein pieced together his creature from the slaughterhouse. Two, Godwin has the same name as Mary Shelley's father, the philosopher William. William Godwin. Now, William Godwin was one of the founding philosophers of anarchism, a philosophy that advocates for the abolition of hierarchical capitalist structures. And what does that mean, please? Well, are you okay, man? Doug will make a new creature from the parts of these stuffies and ensure that the new creature has many friends. What are hi hierarchical capital structures, please? Okay, so we're going to get a bit deep, so stick with me here. Okay, so hierarchy is one way of separating society into tiers, with each tier having different levels of authority and power. Capitalism is an economic system that exists because of private ownership of the means of production and businesses that operate for profit. That is how the world works. When we combine these two, we're talking about powerful people making money. So Godwin Baxter is named after the anti-capitalist William Godwin, and this is one of the reasons this movie is called Poor Things, but we'll talk more about that later on. Now, Poor Things is a Frankenstein of a Frankenstein because this movie borrows heavily from Mary Shelley's novel, but it's not a direct remake of her book. Poor Things is a brand new monster that thrives and sometimes also gets violent, just like Frankenstein's creature. No! Bella. 
So, if Godwin Baxter is a reinvention of Frankenstein's monster, then who is his creation? Bella Baxter. Well, when Mary Shelley was 16, she was sent away to live with a family in Dundee, Scotland, and that family's name was the Baxters. Why'd she go there? Does she also have a Scottish family vacation like us? Hi, Nana. No. She is sent away because her stepmother refused to continue raising her. Shelley's birth mother died when Shelley was just 11 days old. Bella Baxter and Mary Shelley share one incredibly important trait. They are molded by their mothers, but they are essentially motherless. Now, at the beginning of the movie, Bella has a limited vocabulary and moves like a toddler learning to walk. Godwin tells her this about her real parents. They pushed the boundaries of what was known and they paid the price. Bella's existence is a rebellion against the natural order of things, just like Victor Frankenstein's creation of life in Shelley's novel. Now, Shelley wrote Frankenstein during a period of history that was transitioning from what was called the Age of Enlightenment into something called Romanticism. Do I say right now? Well, the Age of Enlightenment was an intellectual and cultural movement during the 17th and 18th centuries that emphasized reason and science. It was followed by Romanticism, and in rebellion to Enlightenment, this movement emphasized emotion, imagination, and nature. So, when Godwin tells Bella about pushing the boundaries of what is known, he is hinting at man's reckoning caused by science grappling with nature. And this was a key theme of the original novel. Frankenstein's science is in conflict with the laws of nature, just as the Enlightenment is in conflict with Romanticism. And Bella embodies this conflict between science and nature. She is a scientific experiment, but as soon as she's allowed out of the house, she fully embraces nature. <laughs> It's subtle, but Bella's journey is punctuated with a journey through natural beauty. We are constantly reminded that Bella is a scientific experiment that is trying to blend in with the natural world. It's fitting that just after Bella enters this pile of leaves, embracing nature, we're given the full explanation of her creation. Godwin placed the brain of a pregnant woman's baby inside her own corpse and then reanimated the body. Now there's a direct parallel to the classic 1931 Frankenstein movie in this scene. It's alive, it's alive. Now Lanthimos gave his designers a brief to create a 1930s studio movie, but with modern traits. Poor Things sets were created on sound stages in Budapest, foregoing modern tech like VFX or the volume. Instead, they made these larger than life theatrical sets similar to old Hollywood movies. And early in the film, they used camera techniques that echo old Hollywood as well, such as the use of long takes, very similar to Hitchcock's Rope, which was filmed with only 11 shots. Many shots linger for far longer than modern films, particularly during Bella's sexual awakening. Poor Things also employs fisheye lenses whenever Bella encounters something new or strange. So this is done so we can see the world through the eyes of a baby, kind of round, distorted, and unfamiliar. Poor Thing's old Hollywood beginning mirrors the newness of Bella because we are beginning to watch her evolution, like we're watching an early 1900s audience watching films for the first time. And then the arrival of the Lothario lawyer Duncan Wedderburn is the catalyst for both Bella and the style of the film to suddenly evolve. Duncan brings Bella into a world of new adventures of art, literature, and sex. Although Bella has agreed to marry Max McCandles, I love the names in this movie, both Godwin and Max reluctantly let Bella travel the world with this slimy lawyer, and then the movie snaps into color. We can't show you that bit though because we'd get demonetized. In a piece for the Mary Sue, production designers Price and Heath compared this change of color to Dorothy entering Oz and the Wizard of Oz. Both feature young women who are entering a magical new world outside their colorless childhoods. This is also where we begin to see more heightened artistic choices, like dramatic skyscapes and abstract architecture. Lanthimos gave Price and Heath a few references to work from. Paintings by Egan Sheila, Hieronymus Bosch, and Francis Bacon. All these artists create work that is dripping in symbolism, much like Poor Things. And the movie uses these artistic references to place us inside Bella's developing brain. Like Heath explains to the YouTube channel Gold Derby. That she was this undefinable being that we did nobody knows or can say what she saw through whose eyes so we always had this element of fantasy that would come from her in a way of seeing this really intense way of seeing so bella is now assaulted with a vibrant artistic world filled with color just as we move from that gray scientific world of the enlightenment into the big natural world of romanticism at their first stop in lisbon portugal bella goes off on her own and finds a fedista <laughs> Now, the lyrics of this song are about feeling lonely and empty while you're trapped in a small room, just like how Bella has snuck out of her hotel room while Duncan was asleep. It's also foreshadowing that Bella will eventually grow out of her relationship with Duncan. We see the beginning of their downfall at a dinner later that evening when she hears lines from Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest. A handbag. <laughs> like in Spider-Man 2. Yeah, exactly. High five. 
Now, this play is the story of two men who use an alter ego to escape their social obligations, just like how Bella is being forced to adopt new manners to fit into this dinner, where she finds the atmosphere frustrating. I must go punch that baby. And the company of... And the woman boring with words. Now, this seemingly random mention of theater is actually quite significant because this dinner scene evolves into a theatrical set piece when Bella is drawn to the dance floor to perform these seemingly uncoordinated, now viral, moves. Now, this is an extremely deep cut and a very deliberate reference, and we're going to pull out our theater nerd card here. Bella and Duncan's dance moves follow a similar style to German theater maker Pina Bausch. Hey. Bausch is known for the creation of Tanz Theater, a marriage of theater and dance, and using this technique to push stories further than we are used to seeing in contemporary dance pieces. This particular style is seen in Contact Tof, which is about the complex relationship between man and woman and how social pressures affect our minds and bodies. And incorporating this dancing technique symbolizes where Bella is at in her journey. Her body has developed, and she's about to take a deep dive into philosophy and the psyche. So instead of laying this out for us in dialogue, the film shows us through this brilliant dance. Even better, this references the style of Bausch's theater and dance combination, which in its own way was a Frankenstein itself. Wow, that's a sound analysis of the German exploration of the universal aspects of the human condition through the language of theatrical movement. Now, Bella's impending philosophical growth causes Duncan to panic, and this is why he shoves Bella inside a literal box and traps her on a cruise ship. Get in basically a floating box at sea. In an interview for Architectural Digest, Price and Heath said the design of the ship was intended to evoke a caged animal, stating the big marble floor shows a tiger about to kill a goat, and there are caged animals in the pictures. And they also said the chandeliers are all ridiculously big, it was supposed to feel claustrophobic. A voyage at sea is also yet another important nod to Frankenstein. Huge chunks of Mary Shelley's novel take place at sea, with its characters constantly bowing to the terrifying realities of nature. And now, Bella is trapped in the middle of the ocean, forced to submit to the will of nature. But here, when Bella is fully immersed in this natural world of romanticism, she meets Martha and Harry. They help her grow her mind by discussing philosophy with her. People and society can be improved. But this improvement through philosophy is people trying to run away from the fact that we are all cruel beasts. And Bella uses Emerson when Duncan throws her book overboard. I'm a changeable feast as are all of we. Now, this Emerson connection is important because Ralph Waldo Emerson was an American philosopher and a key figure in the transcendentalist movement of the 19th century. Person, I'm just, I, listen. Yeah, bud? This video is filled with words. And listen, it's not me. I know what Transylvania movement is, but the poor new creature here doesn't know what you're talking about. All right, so transcendentalism was a philosophical and literary movement that emerged in the early to mid 19th century. It was about individual intuition, the inherent goodness of people, and the transcendence of the individual soul. Again, the movie is showing us Bella's development by pushing us through these evolutions of thought throughout the ages. One of Emerson's lasting legacies was his belief that, quote, life is a boundless privilege. He had an optimism mystic philosophy on the human condition. And now, this philosophy, that life is a precious gift, is being absorbed by a naive Bella. Bella has never suffered any turmoil in her short new life, until now, because Bella reading about this optimism of Emerson actually sets her up for the heartache of Alexandria. In Alexandria, Bella is introduced to the concept of class systems. Remember that anti-hierarchical, anti-capitalist philosophy of William Godwin's we spoke about earlier? Well, this is the scene where that undercurrent boils over and breaks Bella's heart by showing her the unfairness of capitalism. Notice even how the bottom steps of the palace are cut off from the starving masses, creating a chasm between those who have everything and those who can never have anything. It's also fitting that this discovery takes place in Alexandria, once the site of the Library of Alexandria, the repository of the world's knowledge. Because this scene is a key moment where Bella eats from that tree of knowledge, where she learns about the sins of mankind. Now Bella tries to fix the problem by stealing Duncan's money to give to the poor, but then she is confronted by more evils of capitalism when two sailors lie and steal the money for themselves. There sure is a lot of anti-capitalist sentiment floating around in here today, comrade. Exactly, Doug. I mean, in fact, this anti-capitalist message is reinforced by the steampunk Georgian Victorian designs throughout the film. Well, think of the green smoke billowing from the ship, or the gas-powered carriages with mounted horse heads, or even the pitch black punk style of Bella Baxter's hair. These are all influences of the Industrial Revolution, which also took place in the late 18th, early 19th century. So what's that got to do with capitalism? Well, get set for 
for another school of philosophy. Karl Marx, a 19th century philosopher, was connected to the Industrial Revolution through his analysis of economic changes brought about by industrialization. He famously critiqued capitalism in his book Das Kapital, where he questioned the quality of life afforded to man when his life is tied to the capitalist modes of production. So those sailors stole Bella's money because... Because, under capitalism, man cannot coexist with nature in the optimistic way that Emerson had hoped for. Just like Bella cannot remain innocent to the world for the last two acts of this movie. If I know the world, I can improve it. All of this theft of capital causes Bella and Duncan to be thrown off the boat in Paris. And notice the snowy landscape here is peppered with bright red trees. The production designers did this on purpose to create the illusion of lungs. It subtly reminds us of Bella's origins, the piecemeal body parts used in Godwin's experiments. In Paris, Bella meets brothel owner Madame Swiney, played by one of the greatest actors of our generation, Catherine Hunter. Makeup and hair designer Nadia Stacy said that Paris is the first place in the movie where Bella wears makeup. She told the channel Look Behind the Look. And Bella experiments with makeup for the first time in Paris. Stacy also reinforces the idea that we are discovering the world through Bella's eyes. So, Madame Sweeney is a visual feast of makeup and tattoos, and she introduces Bella to new aspects of womanhood. Sweeney teaches Bella some of her harshest life lessons. The Madame has lived this storied life, which is detailed in her tattoos. Stacy also explained that they're a kind of map and a storytelling of people's lives and moments, and you know, kind of you know, wanting to mark uh, an occasion on yourself. She carries on the stolen money story and thoughts on capitalism by telling Bella, We must work. We must make money. But more than that, we must experience everything, not just the good. But Madame Swiney also introduces Bella to her first experience with real physical pain when she bites her twice. <laughs> oh, I am sorry, I drew blood. This is important because this is the beginning of Bella's final massive development of the film. She is forced to grapple with her femininity in a world run by men. Bella has no matriarch figure. She is literally her own mother. Her understanding of womanhood is built entirely from lived experience and literature. This is another very touching similarity to Mary Shelley, whose mother died 11 days after she gave birth to her. But get this, Shelley's mother, Mary Wollstonecraft, was the author of a radical book called A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. Explain. A Vindication of the Rights of Woman is considered to be one of the earliest texts in the history of feminist literature. To put it simply, it is an argument for the equal education and rights of women. And this is where we see, again, how Poor Things is a Frankenstein of Frankenstein. Just like Shelley, Bella grew up without a mother. Both women are influenced by disembodied texts and philosophies that guide their school of thought and help form their personhood. While in Paris, Bella's friends introduce her to socialism, which is a natural continuation of the earliest references to Marxist thought. As Bella begins to understand her role as a woman in society, she develops political opinions as well. We get a great summary of all that when Bella rejects Duncan for the final time. We are our own means of production. Bella returns to London at Godwin's request. She has now evolved physically, sexually, philosophically, socially, and politically. She is a fully formed adult woman. So when Godwin tells her the truth about her origin, the colors of the film turn more realistic. We see less vibrant pinks and yellows because Bella now sees the world as it truly is read your cards and letters home and watched you fearlessly create Bella Baxter with wonder. But the movie still employs one final fisheye lens to evoke childlike confusion when her fairy tale wedding is interrupted. Now, during her wedding, Bella wears a bridal gown that was actually built to resemble a cage. And then Alfie arrives. He is the husband of Victoria Blessington, AKA the adult woman who killed herself and her unborn child, creating Bella. Alfie is first seen through this distorted fisheye POV because this is the last piece of Bella's story that needs to be worked out. We get one last Frankenstein reference when Alfie tells Bella that Victoria would refer to her unborn child as the monster. Remember, that monster is one half of Bella. It could be that the name Victoria Blessington is also a reference to the Victorian age of the late 19th century. Just as Bella is an evolution away from Victoria, the film is taking us from the Victorian era into modern 20th century thought. Now, Alfie brings pure violence into Bella's world. He traps her in his house where he tortures servants to stave off uprisings. He threatens her with genital mutilation so he can control her. Bella's final test comes in the form of a spiked martini, where she admits to the small temptation of... In some ways it would be a relief to be rid of my questing self. And this is where Poor Things drives home its point. The story of Poor Things is one of female evolution of thought. It's Eve biting the apple. It's Barbie asking this. Do you guys ever think about 
not dying. It's Mary Shelley reading her mom's essay, the first piece of feminist literature ever written, and then going on to write the very first ever and greatest science fiction novel, Frankenstein. And in Poor Things, this is Bella grabbing Alfie's gun and shooting him in the foot. So Bella turns Alfie into a goat man, letting Christopher Abbott show off his Straussburg training. He behaves like a beast, so now she has reduced him to a beast. And then, and this is so good, we are treated to a final parting shot of Bella studying for her exams, sitting with her friends in the garden. This parting shot is a reference to the painting The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. Bosch's painting is a triptych depicting the fate of humanity, and it's fitting that this is where we end after two hours of pondering science, nature, creation, philosophy, and political theory. Poor Things is a movie that asks us to consider what made us, what we're made for, and what it all means in the end. Because, much like this Garden of Earthly Delights, the world of Poor Things is vast and storied and detailed, but can also be a little bit frightening. We can only hope to one day understand a fraction of existence or where we fit into this strange, strange world. Yeah, you are a reminder of my liminal understanding of existence. So that's everything we noticed in Poor Things. Big shout out to the writer of this video, Ms. Victoria Barclay. You can find her social links below. And if you have any other cool Easter eggs or anti-capitalist propaganda, feel free to let us know in the comments or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.